This season for Advent, uh, Beth and I decided to build a nativity scene, if it will, sort of piece by piece. So here's the first, the angel, which gets this going. This, of course, is the angel with the shepherds, but I want you to pretend for the sake of today that it's Gabriel. We'll start with Gabriel. Will you join me in prayer before we turn to the word, though? Our Father, as we prepare to hear your word uh, in the same way that Mary received your word 2,000 years ago, may we remain as open to what you have for us to say, what you have for us to hear, for what you would have for us to do as Mary was back then. In your name we pray, amen. Our reading this morning uh, comes from the two appearances of Gabriel in the first chapter of Luke. Uh, So here and now, these words from the book that we love. The first appearance to Zechariah. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled, and he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God." And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. The second appearance is to Mary later on in the chapter. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. This is the word of the Lord. It always occurs to me every year when I uh, begin preaching around Advent, I'm struck anew at how much of the story of Christmas is really a part of the kind of, uh, almost like barnacles on a hull, just kind of like the accretions of years and years and years of telling this story, and how refreshing it is sometimes to return to the gospel and just kind of realize that many of the things that we have in our minds or in our Christmas decorations or so forth are really just kind of tradition or lore, things that are about it. It's, it's natural, right? I mean, in your own family, surely, the stories you tell the most often are the ones that end up kind of getting exaggerated maybe a little bit over time or little bits and pieces kind of sneak in over time. The same thing has happened in the church. So as we go through these characters of Christmas and as we build our nativity scene, I want us to examine sort of each character anew for the first time, if you will. And today, let's begin with Gabriel. Who is this Gabriel? And why is he in this story? And what does he signify? But before we do that, I want you all to engage with me in a little bit of honest uh, gameplay, I guess. I'm gonna, I, I want you to do this for me, if you will. I want you to, in your mind... Picture an angel, right? Just for a few minutes. All right. 
Now I'm going to ask you to be honest about what you pictured. All right, how many? I've got five guesses about what you have in your mind. Okay, how many of you have this one? What I call baby angel. No, now come on. Now this is supposed to be a game of honest truth telling. Nobody has baby angel in their mind. Sweet baby angel. Oh my goodness. Okay, I've struck out with number one. Well, this is like the first one, right? And, and a lot of this comes, like I say, not from the Bible, but it comes from uh, Greek mythology, right? This is a Cupid or something that would be like up in heaven, so to speak, up around the gods. Um, uh, this, so, so nobody had baby angel. Okay, so I'm going to go with the opposite end of the spectrum. How many had teenage mutant ninja warrior angel? <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes, we have a few. Any others? Like, yes, yeah, strong, masculine, warrior. Okay, um, a lot of people have this image, right, of uh, this is particularly popular maybe with your conservative aunt around Christmas time. I don't know. Like, this has this image of, of, of the angel because it talks about the angels in the Old Testament, right, as warriors, as God's army, as God's host, he's often called. That word host is just an old word that means army. So there's, there's some, some truth to all of these images, right? The first one, I think, plays with an angel's sense of innocence, of sinlessness, maybe. And the second one has to do with its sense of warrior, its sense that it's on God's mission. All right, so this one's a stretch, but how many of you have this one? I, there's got to be one person who has this one in their head, right? Snow angel? No? <laughs> Come on, somebody, somebody had to be thinking of a snow angel? Okay. All right. This one, uh, <laughs> the last time I said historical nerdery, Carl yelled at me, you're a historical nerdery. <laughs> so we're just going to say, this is also historical nerdery. How many of you had this image in your head? Always popular with the Theo bros at Christmas time. The like six-winged angel. This is the Ezekiel angel. No, nobody had this one in your head. This one's. A, I love this meme at Christmas. So if we can just forward one more. There's a whole bunch of these things that go out. Maybe your social media doesn't look like mine, but this is like uh, my family doesn't appreciate my biblically accurate angel ornament. <laughs> uh, no, nobody pictures the like multiple eyes. Okay, so nobody has apocalyptic angel. All right, so now we're just going to throw one, you know, easy one right across home plate. How many people had this image of an angel? All right, this is the traditional Christmas angel, right? And, and, and note the things that aren't necessarily here, but that are part of the lore, right? There's a horn, for instance. You know, there's no horns for the angels until Revelation, an angel has a horn. But there's no horns at the, at the Christmas. They sing, but they don't necessarily play the trumpet. Sorry, I know there's a lot of trumpet players in this congregation, but... There's no trumpet necessarily. Uh, this is the image, though, that is really rooted in the sort of ancient church. So this is your, like, historical nerdery, for the way. This is a fourth-century mosaic of an angel. And if you see, it looks a lot like this. Um, this angel of a horn. There's a few things that are kind of common about it. There's a halo. Once again, no halo in the Bible. But there's a halo to show that it's holy and sinless. Uh, there's wings. So in Greek mythology, right, uh, if any of you remember your high school classes, uh, messengers from the gods often had wings, sometimes on their feet or sometimes on their back. This is where that comes from, that angels have wings because they, they carry messages. They're also, uh, unlike Teenage Mutant Ninja Warrior Angel, uh, they're really, really androgynous. So there was a lot of attention early on that... Um, that angels were neither... Were, they weren't human, and so they weren't men and women... They were androgynous, and in fact, there's a long tradition. Um, if you can go to the next one, this is another, this is in Hagia Sophia. Uh, the emperor often painted his sort of court eunuchs as angels, right? Because the eunuchs were technically, in, the, in that culture, like neither men nor women. And so our, our angels are usually almost always men, although sometimes Christmas angels are women. But there was a real effort in the early church, at least, to kind of have this kind of wan, pale, androgynous look, which may be part of what we associate with being an angel as well. That would be weird for, for Gabriel, maybe, because his name literally means uh, my, my, either man of God or God's man. I don't know <laughs> what that means necessarily for his look. But this is part of our tradition, right, when we think about an angel. And we might think of them as very uh, gentle, so to speak, very caring in the way that a eunuch might have been in that ancient Greek culture. In the Bible, angels appear in stories. 
But you know, there's never a consistent or a clear explanation of what they look like. They tend to look different in every time in which they appear. Um, and, and who knows if what they appear even is necessarily what they are in heaven. I mean, n- none of us except for Ezekiel with that strange angel with all the eyes or, you know, has really like seen an angel necessarily in heaven unless you think of maybe the, the revelation of John, which doesn't really go into depth about what an angel necessarily looked like. So we have taken images of angels and we have thought about them in our own minds and we have started to apply things to them. I almost entitled this sermon like the sermon that goes where angels fear to tread because uh, much like many of the sermons I've been preaching lately, I didn't really want to preach the sermon because I don't know that much about angels. There's not that much in the Bible about angels and yet if you Google angels, uh, you will come up with Lots of information about angels. There's lots of information out there about like the ranks of angels and the names of angels and the styles of angels and what you can do to like talk to an angel or the TV show Touched by an Angel or it's not Touched by an Angel. Is it? What is what's the, yeah, it's, I don't know what it is. Whatever. Whatever it is. Like there's lots of information about angels, but most of it comes from the realm of mythology. It doesn't necessarily come from the Bible. The word angel itself Uh, doesn't even necessarily have a spiritual meaning. We give it that. But in Greek, it just means a messenger. In fact, Luke puns on this a lot, right? Like the angel brings the angel, the good news. The angel brings the good news, right? It's the same sort of word. It's It's a pun there. Even in Hebrew, the word malach Elohim just means the messenger of God. That's what they're called. They're just messengers. And so they're defined not necessarily by what they look like, but by their function, their job is to bring good news to people. And so what we see in the Bible over and over again with angels is that they appear when people are at their lowest often, at their most desperate, when they need a message that God is in control of history, that God has them in their mind. An angel comes to give them the evangel the good news, the gospel, which in its rawest form is simply that God has not gone anywhere. God is here and God is for you, and God will redeem you. We know things about angels from the Bible. For instance, they're presented as speaking. They have intelligence. They're often given emotions. They have a job of praising God in heaven, but the primary thing they do is that they come to believers, to the people of God, and they bring them encouragement. And on the flip side to that, part of rescuing and redeeming the righteous is they often act in swift retribution against those who oppress them. Angels also come, if you think about the angel that comes in Exodus, which we'll talk about this summer, the angel comes not just to redeem Israel, but to destroy Pharaoh who is oppressing him. That is part of the redemption process. And you see that all the way from Genesis to Revelation, where angels come at the end of time to bring comfort, counsel, and encouragement and redemption to people and to put away those that are oppressing them. But our sermon today is not just on angels in general, right? But one angel in particular, Gabriel, one of only two angels in our Bible that is named by name. So the big question of the sermon is, who is Gabriel? And why does God send Gabriel to Mary out of all the ways that he could communicate to her? I mean, he could have shown up right as a, as a burning bush, as a dove, <laughs> spoken in a soft, still voice like Elijah. Why did he choose to announce the birth of Jesus and John through Gabriel? Now, I'll tell you that I'm going into speculation at this point because it doesn't actually say in the story, but here's my best way of answering that question. First of all, I think it's important to realize that this is the second appearance of Gabriel in the Bible. The first time Gabriel appears, he is named by name in the book of Daniel. Now, Daniel is a book that's divided into two halves. In the first half, Daniel, uh, this upright, righteous young man full of wisdom, is one of the, the people that is taken away when the Jews are conquered, and he is taken away into exile, and he lives with these kings where he is a sort of court Israelite, right, where he's a bridge between the conquering people that have taken them into exile and the people themselves. And Daniel fulfills that responsibility 
of when things look the bleakest, Daniel is a role model of wisdom, much like Joseph was, right, under Pharaoh, of someone who can administer justice and keep the faith even though he himself is in exile. And the first half of Daniel deals with stories about Daniel and his friends. But the second half, in chapters 7 through 12, are a series of visions that Daniel has. And these visions are uh, much the same. They're the same words, by the way, that Mary has when she meets Gabriel. Uh, He finds them confusing, troubling, upsetting, these visions that Gabriel gives to him. Uh, Here's, you know, I don't know what these look like, but here's sort of one graphic depiction of themselves. So in contrast to the first half of the book, where Daniel is the one that can interpret other people's dreams, and these visions he has, he doesn't know what they mean. And so Gabriel comes to him and gives him the interpretation of these dreams. There are four of them. The first of them involves four big apocalyptic beasts who fight and then devour one another. And the second involves this, this, this battle between a ram and a goat up in the sky. And the third vision involves a sort of numerical riddle about the end of time and the temple in Jerusalem. And the fourth and final vision involves a vision of all the nations of the world engaged in warfare, one after another, one battle after another, until the bodies just pile up, after which Michael, another named angel, will come and save and deliver God's people. Now, you know, these are sermons in and of themselves, so let me just sort of summarize them by saying this. Each of these visions Gabriel interprets for Daniel, and he says, each of them depict God is the author of history. And that empires and kingdoms, they rise and they fall, not by sheer chance or not by the cunning of the people who run them, but because God himself is engineering all of human history and that he is in control. And even now, while Israel has fallen and in exile, and it looks bleak, and it looks like God has abandoned them, and it looks like God is powerless. The reality is that God sits above all of these things and is guiding Israel into exile for their own purification and sanctification. That God is in control of human history. And even going forth, God will be always in control of human history and has never lost sight of his ability and his desire to love and to redeem God's people. The spiritual being that interprets the first and the fourth vision that Daniel receives is unnamed. And you'll read some debate about it, but most of Christian history says that that's Gabriel. But in the second and third vision, Gabriel is named by name. He is an angel, a messenger, sent to Daniel to deliver him an evangel, good news, a gospel. Your people may be conquered. They may be in exile. You may be fearing that God has lost control of history, but don't worry. Despite the chaos and the bloodshed that empires and governments bring, God is in control and will redeem his people out of exile. So Gabriel is this messenger of good news. So if that's who Gabriel is in the Old Testament, then the why I think Gabriel appears to Mary, right, to me, becomes a little more obvious. I think what God is doing by sending Gabriel is he's meant to bring Mary and Daniel into conversation with one another, to sort of compare them to one another. After all, Mary's situation is very similar to Daniel. Once again, Israel finds itself without a king on the throne of David. Once again, the Israelites, maybe they're not living in Babylon or in Persia, but they're conquered by a foreign empire. And once again, there's this false king on the throne, King Herod, who is oppressing them. And once again, the temple seems polluted and dirty, and it seems confusing. As Beth mentioned, it had been 400 years, right, since they heard anything about these promises, these promises made to Daniel, these promises made to the prophets that God was going to come and he was going to redeem and rescue his people. Where are the answers? Where are the fulfillments of these prophecies? Doesn't it seem in Mary's time as well that God seems to have sort of lost control of the narrative and the chaos seems too much? Where is this redemption that it is promised? And so I think that's why Gabriel is sent once again to Mary to remind in this first proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ the same message that was delivered to Daniel. 
In fact, this is the fulfillment of the same promises that Gabriel had delivered centuries before to Daniel, that God is still the author of history. And God is delivering Israel right now. In fact, the name of the baby that Mary is supposed is to bear is to bear the name of Yeshua. The Lord saves. The Lord, it's even in the present tense. The Lord is saving. The Lord is delivering right now. Now is the moment when human history begins to take a turn. And the revelation and the deliverance that Gabriel promised in the Old Testament is now fully present in human flesh and born of a baby once again. It's interesting that Luke names Mary as sort of discomfort, uh, trouble, doesn't really know what to make of these words. It's the same language that Daniel doesn't quite know what to make of these visions that he has. And, and her objection is, of course, the most concrete one. Uh, uh, I'll use uh, Shirley's PG version. Um, how can this be since I'm not married? But really, like, I feel like the bigger question is like, uh, how can this be? We haven't had a king in 400 years. This promise to like keep the throne of David alive, this promise to, to fulfill your promise to deliver these people has gone completely unanswered. I mean, it seems improbable. 400 years is a long time. That would be like the equivalent of saying, in this country, right, if we go back 400 years, I can still feel a time when there are no Euro-Americans on this continent. That's a long time ago. A lot has happened in 400 years. 400 years is a long time for a promise to lie on the floor being waited, waiting to pick it up, right? And here God comes and he picks it up. And so I think he sends Gabriel because it's the same message. It's the fulfillment of the promise that was given in the Old Testament. That the Lord is here, that the throne of David is not empty, and the time for God to deliver his people is now. Advent is a time, right, when we remember this message of hope and deliverance, and it begins with God, and it begins with God sending his messenger, Gabriel. And maybe we ourselves have many of the same feelings that Daniel once had, especially in the last 30 years in this country. Uh, maybe we ourselves have the same questions that married have. Maybe we look around and see the chaos of imperial collision and wars and bloodshed and politicians and corporations and everything seeming to spiral out of control. And we may say to ourselves, where is this God? Where are these promises? Who's going to pick up these promises off of the floor? Can I tell you then that the message to us is the same message that Gabriel gave to Daniel. It's the same message that Gabriel gave to Mary. This is a dangerous thing to say, but I dare say if Gabriel were here right now, once we stopped being afraid, we would hear the same message again. We hear the same message through his word that God is in control of history. And what looks chaotic to us on the ground might make sense from a cosmic perspective where God's promises are being fulfilled right now to deliver us from sin and bondage. God has come in the person of Christ, and Christ currently now sits on the throne of David, and the kingdom of God is already in motion. And one day, God will come again in the fullness of his glory and truth. Amen. Our Father, as we ponder the message that Gabriel gave centuries ago, as we ponder the, the mystery and the wonder of a God in human flesh, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us, may we nevertheless be in awe and adoration of it. May we respond in the same way Daniel and Mary did, that despite our discomforts, despite our troubles, despite our inability to fully process what these things mean, that we might respond with humble obedience and faith, and that you would have done with us what you will do. In your name we pray. Amen.